It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Michael Masters. I've, I've been blessed in the county. Uh, a lot of very good people have, have come to work for us, and Michael, of course, is one of those. Uh, a year and a half ago, he took over. Uh, the joke I tell about this, of course, is that when I came on board, <clears throat> there were two places in the county that I knew were under federal investigation, and one of them was the Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. So he came in <clears throat> accompanied by lots of federal investigators. So he tells me it's all cleaned up now, which I hope he'll share with you. Uh, Mike came to us from, Michael came to us from the uh, city of Chicago where he was chief of staff to Jody Weiss, who was superintendent of police. He's a graduate with honors of the University of Michigan and Harvard Law School. Please welcome him warmly. Thank you. On September 14th of this past year, at roughly 7.15 p.m., a young man from suburban Cook County got into his vehicle and drove into downtown Chicago, not far from here. As the young man drove, he prayed. He prayed that the attack he was about to attempt would be successful. He prayed that he would kill many innocent people. And he prayed for the destruction of America. The young man, Adele Daoud, 18 years old, believed that the vehicle that he was driving contained a massive amount of explosives. Daoud parked the vehicle in front of the target that he had selected, a bar that often had live music. Daoud had considered a total of 29 potential targets before settling on this, his final choice. He exited the vehicle and calmly walked a block away. He pulled out the detonator and pressed the triggering mechanism. And when nothing happened, he pressed it again. That was Adele Daoud's last act as a free man. Thanks to the men and women of our law enforcement community, Adele Daoud's prayers were not answered that evening. The arrest of Daoud was the culmination of a rigorous undercover operation during which Daoud began around October of 2011 to obtain and distribute material online related to violent jihad and the killing of Americans a time during which he developed his attack plans and surveilled and selected his targets. With that attempt by Dayud, at least 52 publicly known Islamist-inspired terrorist plots have been thwarted in our country since September 11, 2001. And while the global environment has become an increasingly hostile one for terrorist groups, as we've made it increasingly difficult, more difficult for them to operate internationally, they have looked for quicker, cheaper, and easier avenues of attack. And with that, they've looked to homegrown terrorism, to U.S. soil. You see, Adele Daoud never trained in a foreign country. He was born here, and he grew up here. He was educated here. Thanks to the internet, he was also radicalized here. And he came to hate here, America. With Daoud's attempt, at least 43 of those 52 thwarted plots could be considered homegrown. The threat that Adele Daoud posed is one that increasingly confronts us. Americans residing here, living here, radicalized here, who wish harm on us here. In a recent report by the RAND Report, by the RAND Corporation, they noted that Chicago was one of two urban areas that carries a disproportionate share of the terrorism risk burden. The other is New York City. What is more consequential to me than statistics and rankings, however, is the knowledge that our enemies are thinking about us. They are aware of us, and because of that, we cannot for afford to forget about them. It was the Chicago skyline that appeared on the cover of Inspire magazine, Al-Qaeda's most prominent English language recruitment and propaganda publication. Tawahir Rana and David Headley, both charged with plotting the 2008 attacks in Mumbai, resided here. And on October 29, 2010, two bombs bound on separate cargo planes made their way from Yemen to Chicago. Close to 12 years after September 11th, people often ask what it is we do in homeland security and emergency management, and whether it's important, whether it's necessary. From individuals associated with international efforts, to violent homegrown extremists, to mass murderers who target our schools, houses of worship, and other public places, the threats against our country and our communities are more real and more diverse than ever. These plots show how single individuals, 
not world leaders or the commanders of armed forces, can alter events around the globe and within our own communities, and not from capitals or command centers, but from living rooms and laptops. And of course, the threats that face us are not just man-made, as we've seen partially today. One of our most challenging threats comes not from a foreign or domestic enemy, but a companion we live with every day, Mother Nature. The rate of presidential disaster declarations under the last two U.S. administrations has been higher than at any other time in United States history. These events, man-made and natural, show just how connected we are. They show how incidents can cross jurisdictional boundaries from local borders to international ones through the movement of individuals, ideologies, and Mother Nature. They show how the illicit sales of cigarettes can be tied to international terrorist groups and how the dope that a gangbanger is slinging on one of our street corners can be tied to narco-terrorism halfway around the world. Because of all this, it means our response, our planning, and our training must be coordinated. They must be connected. This need could be made more challenging in Cook County by virtue of our size and geography, as well as our diversity, socioeconomic, cultural, demographic. But it is that very size and diversity, to say nothing of our own tenacity and resiliency, which can be also our greatest assets. For when focused and working together, we can overcome the challenges that confront us. Today, I'd like to talk to you about where we were in Cook County in these areas when President Preckwinkle took office, how far we've come, and where we plan to go. I'd like to, of course, thank the City Club of Chicago and Jay Doherty in particular for being here today, as well as all of you. I was actually, between the weather and, and the events of today and the wide field of candidates, I'm, I'm actually impressed by the turnout. I thought most of the people that come to these lunches would be running in the second congressional district primary. <laughs> so, as President Preckwinkle just mentioned, uh, when she speaks about our department, she does tend to mention that interesting historical fact that uh, we were under federal investigation when she came into county government. And if you've spent time with my boss, you know that she doesn't really wait for issues or problems to find her. She goes out and she solves them. And she's challenged all of us that work for her to meet her same standards of excellence. So I was very honored in May of 2011 when she asked me to take over this department. It's a great honor to serve her and in her administration and for the residents of Cook County. And I'm proud of the progress that we've made in just over 21 months. I'm able to stand before you today and say that thanks to the President's leadership, the Cook County Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management has corrected those problematic issues of its past while charting a path forward that ensures and wait for the FEMA language that we are able to protect, prevent against, respond to, and recover from all incidents, whether man-made or natural. The pro proactive role that Cook County has taken in these areas is not only an important one, it's a critical one for our communities, but that hasn't always been the case. When I arrived at the department, the condition that I found it in was, in a word, disturbing. No ability to support our local as well as state and federal partners. No functional training or exercises being provided to our first responders. Zero operational capacity and total financial disarray. Simple things. I'd been at the department only a few weeks and it was the first hot day in June. It was hitting about 98 degrees at about 8.30 in the morning. So I asked to see our extreme heat plan. The second largest county in the United States, one of the busiest public health systems in the nation as part of our government, one of the largest medical examiner's offices in the country, one of the most active criminal justice systems, and nothing. No heat plan. No cold plan. No plans for practically anything. That, well, that's not quite true. They usually had a very developed lunch plan for that lunch hour, but other than that, <laughs> you're, you're on your own. If we fail or if we succeed can be measured in whether people live or die. It is that simple. And the attitude that the department had at that point to complete that mission was unacceptable. Very quickly, I began meeting with our partners in the county's 134 jurisdictions. I spoke with my colleagues at the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, FEMA, as well as our partners in the private, academic, and nonprofit sectors. And I'd like to take a minute to, to recognize one of them right now, Gary Schenkel, the Executive Director of the City's Office of Emergency Management and Communications. <laughs> Gary is uh, not only my counterpart at the city, he's also a friend and in most items a co-conspirator of mine. Uh, retired Marine Corps officer, we, we tend to stick together. And what I have been able to accomplish, what we have been able to accomplish, wouldn't be possible without Gary's leadership and his forward-leaning efforts. And I'm very appreciative for that. 
And it was through those conversations with Gary and people like him that we realized that when Cook County fails to step up to the plate, everyone else suffers. Whether it is a smaller jurisdiction that is calling on us to help them in an incident response, or it is the state or FEMA who are relying on us to mitigate an issue before it becomes a problem, or simply, and most importantly, our residents. So we set about changing that. We were going to do better because we had to do better. Our first step was a total organizational redesign of the department. I happen to believe that you train like you play, or you should, so we reorganized the department to mirror the National Incident Command System. That means every day the members of our team are operating in the roles that they would be in during an actual event. It's muscle memory. Communication is also a vital part of what we do. When I stepped into this position outside of a fax machine, and it wasn't such a great fax machine, uh, we had no mechanism to communicate with Cook County jurisdictions, let alone internally with Cook County departments effectively, whether it's just our department to the health and hospital system, for instance. About six weeks into my position, it started to rain on a Saturday, and it was raining badly. Previously, the department would just sit and wait for jurisdictions to call them to tell them that they were flooding. Not this time. We weren't going to sit around and wait for problems to find us. We were going to go out and solve them, because at the point they came to us, it was too late to fix them. That day was the first time that Cook County invited all the jurisdictions along the Des Plaines River onto a conference call to discuss the weather, the conditions they faced, and the resources they might need to assist them in a response. We have created an intelligence gathering and distribution center, which we refer to as our duty desk. We send out intelligence updates to thousands of first responders, stakeholders, and key partners every day. These alerts range from weather to traffic to threats. When the Sikh temple in Madison, Wisconsin was attacked, we immediately put out an alert to our suburban law enforcement partners. We also were in direct communications with the jurisdictions in Cook County that have Sikh institutions in them. This process increases situational awareness. It improves decision advantage. It enhances partnerships. And at the end of the day, we are getting the information in the hands of the people that need it, the men and women who are serving on our front lines as first responders. But what happens when events overtake us? or someone just needs a hand. We've been working diligently to put the mechanisms in place to help our stakeholders. From investing in a $45 million camera system that never fully worked, Cook County has turned the page. We are no longer buying toys. We are investing in tools, and we are putting them in the hands of the men and women that need them. We're efficiently using previous investments, too. There were too many items that were purchased and never effectively used. Cook County had three mobile command posts. The problem? They were hardly used. They were six years old and they still smelled new. If you've never worked in it and you've never trained on it, you're going to fail when you need to use it during an actual event. We wanted those items out. We wanted them tested. We wanted them dirty and ready for action. And that's, ex would we tell a fireman not to unroll roll his fire hose because we didn't want it to get it dirty to train on? Would we tell a police officer never to fire his service weapon? No, and the same is true in emergency management. So those command posts are now being used. Our partners know they're available and they are requesting them. Just two weeks ago, they assisted in a response to a barricaded gunman, and just yesterday, they assisted in a response to a large natural gas leak. We are supporting one another in our public safety efforts. We're also enhancing our operational and logistics capability to assist our partners. This ensures developing issues don't become major problems. The first weekend in July of last year, it was about 100 degrees at 10 p.m. on a Sunday night when our duty desk received a phone call. A 16-story nursing home in suburban Cook County had lost power. 300 seniors. No water, no elevators, no toilets, no lights. It was at least 105 degrees when we walked in the lobby. Firemen who were pouring sweat were trying to pull, evacuate the seniors down from the 16 flights of stairs. We saw seniors who were unsure of what was going on and confused. They were scared. There had to be a better way. Why evacuate those people? Why not have the processes in place to shelter them in place? Have portable cooling, light towers. Take everybody, put them into the cafeteria, stick a Cary Grant movie on the movie screen, call it a day. These are not difficult solutions, they're common sense ones. And we started working with our partners, among them ComEd and some of our others, to begin dealing with these issues. The very next day, we were onboarding the tools to deal with those incidents, portable heating and tooling tools, light towers, etc. From our own experiences to those of our staff who have responded to everything from 9-11 in New York, to Hurricane Katrina, 
to the ongoing conversations with our having our, we are having with our partners across the country, such as those in New Jersey. We are building a best practices agency, and we are doing it prudently for less than the cost that the previous administration spent to outfit one squad car with Project Shield equipment, we built an entire incident command center. We are constantly evolving and adapting. And one of the most critical components of this is ensuring that our first responders have not merely the tools, but the training to perform and undertake their mission. We have gone from a county that offered no functional training and exercise to one that has trained over 5 thousand first responders since 2012. We are training police, fire, and emergency management in skill sets ranging from active shooter response to urban search and rescue. And while we are training these first responders on skill sets that are related to homeland security and emergency management, these are trainings and skills that they can use, whether they're a policeman or a fireman, every time they step out of a squad car or off a fire rig in your towns, villages, and cities every single day. Less than two weeks ago, we had over 615 first responders and educators gathered together for a uh, training on active shooter incident response. It was the largest in-person school violence training that we know of anywhere in the country to date. My, my boss is an educator. I am lucky I get to teach a class every once in a while, too, at a law school, local law school, John Marshall. In the last 50 years, not a single child has been lost in a school fire. We have fire signs and fire doors. We have fire drills. We have fire extinguishers. But we haven't done enough on violence. From the gangs, guns, and drugs that plague too many of our streets to the violence that occurs in our schools, we can do more and we must do more and Cook County is doing more. This year we will train over a thousand law enforcement officers in responding to an active shooter event at our schools, houses of worship, workplaces, and other locations. We will train educators and continue to meet with school administrators on best practices. We are going to confront these threats together, so we are training on them together. General George Patton once noted, the soldier is the army, and no army is better than its soldiers. Our army are our first responders. We are working to give them the tools so they can do their jobs professionally, safely, and effectively. Effective emergency management, though, isn't possible without partnerships, and those require trust, hard work, and cooperation. We've been building those relationships. We're working with our local jurisdictions, and I know there's some here today, the city, the state and FEMA, as well as DHS and our mutual aid partners from fire, the fire service, Mavis, as well as Air One on the aviation side. John Monken at the state, as well as Gary, I like to note, and I probably speak more in a day than our predecessor spoke in two or three years combined. For the first time ever, under the leadership of President Preckwinkle and Mayor Emanuel, the county and the city have developed a joint strategic plan for our urban area. We collaborate on training and exercise and on our spending priorities. We are working with other departments from the health and hospital system and technology to the forest preserve and the sheriff's office. We have made incredible strides in a short amount of time. And while we have done well, there is still much more to do. And one aspect which is critical to this is each of you. Every single time there's an incident, whether it's a weather event or it's an active shooter, we hear the same thing. I never thought it could happen here. We are working to make sure that it doesn't, but if it does, we need to be able to respond effectively and efficiently. And we are working to do that. We're working to do it so that we can meet the threats that confront us when they confront us. Take a moment to think about the energy grid. What would happen if not that one nursing home, but five, 10, or 50 lost power? What if it wasn't just for a day, thanks to ComEd, it was only for four hours, or a week? But what about if it was for months? Would we be prepared to handle that? Is it even possible? Think about the Northeast blackout of 2003, which affected 45 million people in eight states. The cause? A transmission line hit unpruned foliage. An overgrown tree and a software bug. Now consider the structure of the US energy grid. 160,000 miles of high voltage lines, 5 million miles of distribution lines, 
thousands of generators and transformers, tens of thousands of other pieces of equipment. And the grids that connect them, just three, east, west, and Texas. They're still doing their own thing. In, <laughs> there. And only 12 points of connectivity between them. And now add on to that infrastructure issue, almost the entire system is cyber-based. Brett can talk about that in May when he comes up here. And other threats and issues? Solar storms in the Canadian province of Quebec knocked out power to over 6 million people in under 120 seconds in 1989. The National Academy of Sciences estimates that a massive solar storm could damage our electrical grid to the size equivalent of 20 Katrina-class hurricanes, taking over a decade to recover from. And then, of course, there are the squirrels. <laughs> Every year, squirrels cause power outages. In November 2012, Middle State Tennessee University's entire electrical grid and telephone system went down because of a squirrel. It was a bad day for someone at the university. In fairness, it was a worse day for the squirrel, just so we're all clear. He didn't, <laughs> did not fare well at all. I'm not saying the US electrical grid is going to be brought down by a, by a squirrel, but what I am saying is there are a lot of variables and there are a lot of vulnerabilities, and what are some of the effects? Supermarkets cleaned out of food within days, generators that run out of gas, gas stations that run dry or unable to pump. Think about the lines in New Jersey. Often it wasn't that there wasn't gas, it's there was no electricity to pump the gas. What also happens when the lights go out? Crime goes up. Very quickly, 72 hours, social systems begin breaking down. Think about some of the stories we began to hear from that Carnival cruise ship just two weeks ago. We start a very quick, slippery slope down Maslow's power pyramid. We need to be prepared to address these issues. And that responsibility is not only on first responders, but on each of us as residents. We recommend people be self-sufficient for at least 72 hours. Could you do that right now? What would you need for yourself, for your family, to assist your neighbors? Water, food, medication, glasses, clothing. These are critical issues, not just for the people in this room, but for acro people across the county. We must ensure that we are taking a comprehensive approach to get all of our residents prepared, particularly those with the greatest challenges and the least resources. It does us no good, either economically or morally, if one part of the county stands while another part falls. We have to be prepared to survive all as one together. To address resident preparedness, I'm very proud to announce to you that Cook County is undertaking a comprehensive community emergency response program. This program will educate people about disaster preparedness for hazards that may impact their community, as well as train people in basic disaster response skills such as fire safety, light search and rescue, team organization, and first aid. This will allow all of us to not only be better neighbors and better prepared, but to be better citizens. This program is simply another component of our efforts under the President's leadership to get all of our residents and communities prepared. Sir Winston Churchill once noted, to every man there comes in his lifetime that special moment when he is figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered a chance to do a very special thing, unique to him and fitted to his talents. The men and women of our first responder agencies do that special thing every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. These are men and women who run towards gunfire and they run into collapsing buildings. As we saw last night, sometimes they get hurt doing it. Sometimes they don't come out at all. We owe it to them to do what we can to be prepared. Our department has a group of these men and women. You've heard me speak about the progress that we've made. This wouldn't be possible without the fantastic team that we've been able to assemble. And while I'm honored to speak to you today, the honor and the achievement and work is actually theirs, and I'd like them to stand up and be recognized. They're all over the room, so go ahead, guys. <laughs> Lastly, and most importantly, we're in Homeland Security. We can't do our own jobs unless our homelands are secure. And for that, I'd like to recognize and thank my family, my parents particularly, my dad and Linda and my mom and Barry, as well as Margie and Stephen and Howard and Sue. As well as my amazing partner and a wonderful mother, Pamela. I couldn't... 
I couldn't do my job or be the person I am without their love and support, and I'm very, very grateful for it, particularly on late nights and early mornings when I'm not around. Sorry, Pam. <laughs> Cook County, under President Preckwinkle's leadership, is working to ensure that we are successful in our efforts to support both our first responders and our residents, making our communities safer and more secure as a result. We're here to help. Contact us. We're here to speak with you, to work with you, and to assist in better preparing all of us for the future. And it's a future that we look forward to, for while the threats exist and the dangers are real, we have the tools and the training and certainly the commitment to get the job done together. So let us begin. Thank you very much. Good job, Mike. Mike, uh, thanks for cheering us up. Uh, we have a... Um... I also do weddings and bar mitzvahs, just in case yeah. anyone... <laughs> That's very good. And uh, I... That's enough. Uh, Joy Saxon, always first. The, the Lawrence Spivak of our um, organization. Those of you who don't know who Lawrence Spivak was, that means you're awfully young and the heck with you. Do you, have, do you have enough funding to do your job of protecting us? <laughs> I didn't make this question up. There you go. Certainly from the county's corporate budget, we do have the funding. And I think that, and I, I will say, uh, in all honesty, the fact that we've been able to assemble the team that we have and do the work that we've been able to do as a department is because of the commitment that the president has shown towards what we do. Um, it wouldn't be possible without her leadership and without our, and, and look at the results that we get. Because of the internal investments, we've been able to leverage the significant federal grant funding that we've gotten to do the training, such as for 5,000 first responders in suburban Cook County and in partnership with, our, with the city for first responders in Chicago. So I think, you know, in, in our honest moments, Gary and I, when we, when we talk about the federal grant dollars we get, we would say we always can use more, uh, and we're happy to take it. But we, what's critical is if you look at where the funding is going across the country, it has been decreasing in the area of DHS grants, Department of Homeland Security grants. Um, the urban areas of which we are one have gone down from 64 to 32 this past year, roughly. We are one of 10 original urban areas. And what's significant to me is that we took the second lowest cut of any urban area in the United States this past funding cycle. New York took a 0% cut, and then we took a a cut, but it was the second lowest behind New York. And what that says to me is the approach that we are taking under the leadership of the President and the Mayor and that Gary and I get to deal with every day is one that makes sense. It's a collaborative approach. You know, unless we figure that, that smallpox or an epidemic is going to stop at Austin Boulevard from coming from the county into the city or vice versa, the manner in which we did planning before just didn't make sense. And we're taking a collaborative approach to that, and we're doing it with our partners, whether it's the health and hospital system on the public health side, or uh, it's the fire service or law enforcement response and another. So it's less about the money, which everyone can always use more of, than how we're using it. And we're using it wisely and prudently. And that wouldn't be possible without the partnerships that we have. Any other questions? You, you stunned them. They're, uh, <laughs> they're doing... How about a big round of applause for our speakers? <laughs> 